Lost Boys by Orson Scott Card. I've worried for a long time about whether to tell this story as fiction or fact. Telling it with made-up names would make it easier for some people to take. Easier for me, too. But to hide my own lost boy behind some phony made-up name would be like erasing him. So I'll tell it the way it happened and to hell with whether it's easy for either of us. Christine and the kids and I moved to Greensboro on the 1st of March, 1983. I was happy enough about my job. I just wasn't sure I wanted a job at all. But the recession had the publishers all panicky, and nobody was coming up with advances large enough for me to take a decent amount of time writing a novel. I suppose I could whip out 75,000 words of junk fiction every month and publish them under a half dozen pseudonyms or something, but it seemed to Christine and me that we'd do better in the long run if I got a job to write out the recession. Besides, my Ph.D. was down the toilet. I'd been doing good work at Notre Dame, but when I had to take out a few weeks in the middle of a semester to finish my novel Heart's Hope, the English department was about as understanding as you'd expect from people who prefer their authors dead or domesticated. Can't feed your family? Oh, so sorry. You're a writer? Ah, but not one that anyone's written a scholarly essay about. So long, boyo. So sure, I, I was excited about my job, but moving to Greensboro also meant that I had failed. I had no way of knowing that my career as a fiction writer wasn't over. Maybe I'd be editing and writing books about computers for the rest of my life. Maybe fiction was just a phase I had to go through before I got a real job. Greensboro was a beautiful town, especially to a family from the western desert. So many trees that even in winter you could hardly tell there was a town there at all. Christine and I fell in love with it at once. There were local problems, of course. People bragged about Greensboro's crime rate and talked about racial tension and whatnot. But we'd just come from a depressed northern industrial town with race riots in the high schools, so to us this was Eden. There were rumors that several child disappearances were linked to some serial kidnapper, but this was the era when they started putting pictures of missing children on milk cartons. Those stories were in every town. It was hard to find decent housing for a price we could afford. I, I had to borrow from the company against my future earnings just to make the move. We ended up in the ugliest house on Chinka Drive. Now, you know the house, the one with the cheap wood siding in a neighborhood of brick, the one-level rambler surrounded by split levels and two stories, old enough to be shabby, not old enough to be quaint. But it had a big fenced yard and enough bedrooms for all the kids and for my office, too, because we hadn't given up on my writing career, not yet, not, not completely. And the little kids, Jeffrey and Emily, thought the whole thing was really exciting, but Scotty, the oldest, he had a little trouble with it. He'd already had kindergarten and half of first grade at a really wonderful private school down the block from our house in South Bend. Now he was starting over in mid-year, losing all his friends. He had to ride a school bus with strangers. He resented the move from the start, and it didn't get better. Of course, I wasn't the one who saw this. I was at work, and I very quickly learned that success at compute books meant giving up a few little things like seeing your children. I had expected to edit books written by people who couldn't write. What astonished me was that I was editing books about computers written by people who couldn't program. And not all of them, of course, but enough that I spent far more time rewriting programs so they made sense, so they even ran, than I did fixing up people's language. I'd get to work at 8.30 or 9 o'clock, then work straight through till 9.30 or 10.30 at night. My meals were three musketeers bars and potato chips from the machine in the employee lounge. My exercise was typing. I met deadlines, but I was putting on a pound a week, and my muscles were all atrophying, and I saw my kids only in the mornings as I left for work. Except Scotty. Because he left on the school bus at 6.45, and I rarely dragged out of bed until 7.30. During the week, I never saw Scotty at all. The whole burden of the family had fallen on Christine. During my years as a freelancer from 78 till 83, we'd got used to a certain pattern of life based on the fact that Daddy was home. She could duck out and run some errands, leaving the kids because I was home. If one of the kids was having discipline problems, I was there. Now, if she had her hands full and needed something from the store, or if the toilet clogged, or if the Xerox jammed, then she had to take care of it herself somehow. Now, she learned the joys of shopping with a cart full of kids. Add to this the fact that she was pregnant and sick half the time, and you could understand why sometimes I couldn't tell whether she was ready for sainthood or the funny farm. The finer points of child-rearing just weren't within our reach at that time. She knew that Scotty wasn't adapting well at school, but what could she do? What could I do? Scotty had never been the talker Jeffrey was. He spent a lot of time just keeping to himself. Now, though, it was getting extreme. He'd answer in monosyllables or not at all, sullen, as if he were angry, and yet if he was, he, he didn't know it or wouldn't admit it. 
He'd get home, scribble out his homework. Did they give homework when I was in first grade? And then he'd just mope around. If he had done more reading or even watched TV, then we wouldn't have worried so much. His little brother Jeffrey was already a compulsive reader at age five, and Scotty used to be. But now Scotty'd pick up a book and set it down again without reading it. He didn't even follow his mom around the house or anything. She'd see him sitting in the family room, go in and change the sheets on the beds, put away a load of clean clothes, and then come back in and find him sitting in the same place, his eyes open, staring at nothing. I tried talking to him, just the conversation you'd expect. Scotty, we know you didn't want to move. We had no choice. Sure, that's okay. You'll make new friends in due time. I know. Aren't you ever happy here? I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, right. But we didn't have time to fix things up, don't you see? Maybe if we'd imagined this was the last year of Scotty's life, we'd have done more to right things, even if it meant losing the job. But you never know that sort of thing. You always find out when it's too late to change anything. And when the school year ended, things did get better for a while. For one thing, I saw Scotty in the mornings. For another thing, he didn't have to go to school with a bunch of kids who were either rotten to him or ignored him. And he didn't mope around the house all the time. Now he moped around outside. At first, Christine thought he was playing with our other kids, the way he used to before school divided them. But gradually, she began to realize that Jeffrey and Emily always played together, and Scotty almost never played with them. She'd see the younger kids with their squirt guns or running through the sprinklers or chasing the wild rabbit who lived in the neighborhood, but Scotty was never with them. Instead, he'd be poking a twig into the tent fly webs on the trees or digging around at the open skirting around the bottom of the house that kept animals out of the crawl space. Once or twice a week, he'd come in so dirty that Christine had to heave him into the tub, but it didn't reassure her that Scotty was acting normally. On July 28th, Christine went to the hospital and gave birth to our fourth child. Charlie Ben was born having a seizure and stayed in intensive care for the first weeks of his life as the doctors probed and poked and finally figured out that they didn't know what was wrong. It was several months later that somebody uttered the words cerebral palsy, but our lives had already been transformed by then. Our whole focus was on the child in the greatest need. That's what you do, or so we thought. But how do you measure a child's need? How do you compare those needs and decide who deserves the most? When we finally came up for air, we discovered that Scotty had made some friends. Christine would be nursing Charlie Ben, and Scotty would come in from outside and talk about how he'd been playing army with Nicky, or how he and the guys had played pirate. At first she thought they were neighborhood kids, but then one day when he talked about building a fort in the grass, I didn't get many chances to mow, she happened to remember that she'd seen him building that fort all by himself. Then she got suspicious and started asking questions. Nicky who? I don't know, Mom. Just Nicky. Where does he live? Around, I don't know, under the house. In other words, imaginary friends. How long had he known them? Nicky was the first, but now there were eight names. Nicky, Van, Roddy, Peter, Steve, Howard, Rusty, and David. Christine and I had never heard of anybody having more than one imaginary friend. Now, the kid's going to be more successful as a writer than I am, I said, coming up with eight fantasies in the same series. Christine didn't think it was funny. He's so lonely, Scott, she said. I'm worried that he might go over the edge. Now, it was scary. But if he was going crazy, what then? Now, we even tried taking him to a clinic, though I had no faith at all in psychologists. Their fictional explanations of human behavior seemed pretty lame, and their cure rate was a joke. A plumber or barber who performed at the same level as a psychotherapist would be out of business in a month. I took time off work to drive Scotty to the clinic every week during August, but Scotty didn't like it, and the therapist told us nothing more than what we already knew, that Scotty was lonely and morose and a little bit resentful and a little bit afraid. The only difference was that she had fancier names for it. We were getting a vocabulary lesson when we needed help. The only thing that seemed to be helping was the therapy we came up with ourselves that summer. So we didn't make another appointment. Our homegrown therapy consisted of keeping him from going outside. It happened that our landlord's father, who had lived in our house right before us, was painting the house that week, so that gave us an excuse. And I brought home a bunch of video games, ostensibly to review them for compute, but primarily to try to get Scotty involved in something that would turn his imagination away from those imaginary friends. It worked, sort of. He didn't complain about not going outside, but then he never complained about anything. And he played the video games for hours a day. Christine wasn't sure she loved that, but it was an improvement, or so we thought. 
Once again we were distracted and didn't pay much attention to Scotty for a while. We were having insect problems. One night Christine's screaming woke me up. Now you've got to realize that when Christine screams it means everything's pretty much okay. When something really terrible is going on she gets cool and quiet and handles it. But when it's a little spider or a huge moth or a stain on a blouse then she screams. I expected her to come back into the bedroom and tell me about this monstrous insect she had to hammer to death in the bathroom. Only this time she didn't stop screaming. So I got up to see what was going on. She heard me coming. I was up to 230 pounds by now, so I sounded like Custer's whole cavalry. And she called out, Put your shoes on first. I turned on the light in the hall. It was hopping with crickets. I went back into my room and put on my shoes. After enough crickets have bounced off your naked legs and squirmed around in your hands, you stop wanting to puke. You just scoop them up and stuff them into a garbage bag. Later, you can scrub yourself for six hours before you feel clean and have nightmares about little legs tickling you. But at the time, your mind goes numb and you just do the job. The infestation was coming out of the closet in the boys' room, where Scotty had the top bunk and Jeffrey slept on the bottom. There were a couple of crickets in Jeff's bed, but he didn't wake up even as we changed his top sheet and shook out his blanket. Nobody but us even saw the crickets. We found the crack in the back of the closet, sprayed black flag into it, and then stuffed it with an old sheet we were using for rags. Then we showered, making jokes about how we could have used some seagulls to eat up our invasion of crickets, like the Mormon pioneers got in Salt Lake. Then we went back to sleep. It wasn't just crickets, though. That morning in the kitchen, Christine called me again. There were dead June bugs about three inches deep in the window over the sink, all down at the bottom of the space between the regular glass and the storm window. I opened the window to vacuum them out, and the bug corpses spilled all over the kitchen counter. Each bug made a nasty little rattling sound as it went down the tube toward the vacuum filter. The next day the window was three inches deep again, and the day after. Then it tapered off. Hot fun in the summertime. We called the landlord to ask whether he'd help us pay for an exterminator. His answer was to send his father over with bug spray, which he pumped into the crawl space under the house with such gusto that we had to flee the house and drive around all that Saturday until a late afternoon thunderstorm blew away the stench or drowned it enough that we could stand to come back. Anyway, what with that and Charlie's continuing problems, Christine didn't notice what was happening with the video games at all. It was on a Sunday afternoon that I happened to be in the kitchen drinking a Diet Coke and heard Scotty laughing out loud in the family room. That was such a rare sound in our house that I went and stood in the door to the family room watching him play. It was a great little video game with terrific animation, children in a sailing ship battling pirates who kept trying to board, and shooting down giant birds that tried to nibble away the sail. It didn't look as mechanical as the usual video game, and one feature I really liked was the fact that the player wasn't alone. There were other computer-controlled children helping the player's figure to defeat the enemy. Come on, Sandy, Scotty said, come on whereupon one of the children on the screen stabbed the pirate leader through the heart, and the pirates fled. I couldn't wait to see what scenario this game would move to then, but at that point Christine called me to come and help her with Charlie. When I got back, Scotty was gone, and Jeffrey and Emily had a different game in the Atari. Now, maybe it was that day, maybe later, that I asked Scotty what was the name of that game about children on a pirate ship. It was just a game, Dad, he said. Well, it's got to have a name. Now, I don't know. How do you find the disc to put it in the machine? I don't know. And he sat there staring past me, and I gave up. Summer ended. Scotty went back to school. Jeffrey started kindergarten, so they rode the bus together. Most important, things settled down with the newborn, Charlie. There wasn't a cure for cerebral palsy, but at least we knew the bounds of his condition. He wouldn't get worse, for instance. He also wouldn't get well. Maybe he'd talk and walk some day, and maybe he wouldn't. Our job was just to stimulate him enough that if it turned out he wasn't retarded, his mind would develop even though his body was so drastically limited. It was doable. The fear was gone and we could breathe again. Then, in mid-October, my agent called to tell me that she'd pitched my Alvin Maker series to Tom Doherty at Tor Books, and Tom was offering enough of an advance that we could live. That, plus the new contract for Ender's Game, and I realized that for us, at least, the recession was over. For a couple of weeks I stayed on at Compute Books, primarily because I had so many projects going that I couldn't just leave them in the lurch. But then I looked at what the job was doing to my family and to my body, and I realized the price was too high. I gave two weeks' notice, figuring to wrap up the projects that only I knew about. In true paranoid fashion, they refused to accept the two weeks. They had me clean my desk out that afternoon. It left a bitter taste to have them act so churlishly, but what the heck, I was free. I was home. 
You could almost feel the relief. Jeffrey and Emily went right back to normal. I actually got acquainted with Charlie Ben. Christmas was coming. I start playing Christmas music when the leaves turn. And all was right with the world. Except Scotty. Always except Scotty. It was then that I discovered a few things that I simply hadn't known. Scotty never played any of the video games I'd brought home from compute. I knew that because when I gave the games back, Jeff and Em complained bitterly. But Scotty didn't even know what the missing games were. Most important, that game about kids in a pirate ship wasn't there. Not in the games I took back and not in the games that belonged to us. Yet Scotty was still playing it. He was playing one night before he went to bed. I'd been working on Ender's Game all day, trying to finish it before Christmas. I came out of my office about the third time I heard Christine say, Scotty, go to bed now. For some reason, without yelling at the kids or beating them or anything, I've always been able to get them to obey when Christine couldn't even get them to acknowledge her existence. Something about a fairly deep male voice. For instance, I could always sing Insomniac Jeffrey to sleep as an infant when Christine couldn't. So when I stood in the doorway and said, Scotty, I think your mother asked you to go to bed. It was no surprise that he immediately reached up to turn off the computer. I'll turn it off, I said. Go. He still reached for the switch. Go, I said, using my deepest voice of God tones. He got up and went, not looking at me. I walked to the computer to turn it off and saw the animated children, just like the ones I'd seen before. Only they weren't on a pirate ship, they were on an old steam locomotive that was speeding along a track. What a game, I thought. The single-sided Atari discs don't even hold 100K, and here they've got two complete scenarios and all this animation, and... and there wasn't a disc in the disc drive. That meant it was a game that you upload and then remove the disc, which meant it was completely RAM resident, which meant all this quality animation fit into a mere 48K. I knew enough about game programming to regard that as something of a miracle. I looked around for the disc. There wasn't one. So Scotty had put it away, thought I. Only I looked and looked and couldn't find any disc that I didn't already know. I sat down to play the game, but now the children were gone. It was just a train, just speeding along. And the elaborate background was gone. It was the plain blue screen behind the train. No tracks either. And then, no train. It just went blank, back to the ordinary blue. I touched the keyboard. The letters I typed appeared on the screen. It took a few carriage returns to realize what was happening. The Atari was in memo pad mode. At first I thought it was a pretty terrific copy protection scheme to end the game by putting you into a mode where you couldn't access memory, couldn't do anything without turning off the machine, thus erasing the program code from RAM. But then I realized that a company that could produce a game so good with such tight code would surely have some kind of sign-off when the game ended. And why did it end? Scotty hadn't touched the computer after I told him to stop. I didn't touch it either. Why did the children leave the screen? Why did the train disappear? There was no way the computer could know that Scotty was through playing, especially since the game had gone on for a while after he walked away. Still, I didn't mention it to Christine, not till after everything was over. She didn't know anything about computers then except how to boot up and get WordStar on the Altos. It never occurred to her that there was anything weird about Scotty's game. It was two weeks before Christmas when the insects came again. And they shouldn't have. It was too cold outside for them to be alive. The only thing we could figure was that the crawl space under our house stayed warmer or something. Anyway, we had another exciting night of cricket bagging. The old sheet was still wadded up in the crack in the closet. They were coming from under the bathroom cabinet this time. And the next day it was daddy long legs spiders in the bathtub instead of June bugs in the kitchen window. Just don't tell the landlord, I told Christine. I couldn't stand another day of that pesticide. It's probably the landlord's father causing it, Christine told me. Remember, he was here painting when it happened the first time, and today he came and put up the Christmas lights. We just lay there in bed, chuckling over the absurdity of that notion. We had thought it was silly, but kind of sweet to have the landlord's father insist on putting up Christmas lights for us in the first place. Scotty went out and watched him the whole time. It was the first time he'd ever seen lights put up along the edge of the roof. I have enough of a case of acrophobia that you couldn't get me on a ladder high enough to do the job. So our house always went undecorated except the tree lights you could see through the window. Still, Christine and I are both suckers for Christmas kitsch. Heck, we even play the Carpenter's Christmas album. So we thought it was great that the landlord's father wanted to do that for us. It was my house for so many years, he said. My wife and I always had him. I don't think this house would look right without lights. Now, he was such a nice old coot anyway, slow but still strong a good steady worker. The lights were up in a couple of hours. 
Christmas shopping, doing Christmas cards, all that stuff. We were busy. And then one morning, only about a week before Christmas, I guess, Christine was reading the morning paper, and she suddenly got all icy and calm, the way she does when something really bad is happening. Scott, read this, she said. Just tell me, I said. This is an article about missing children in Greensboro. I glanced at the headline. It said, Children Who Won't Be Home for Christmas. I don't want to hear about it, I said. I can't read stories about child abuse or kidnapping. They make me crazy. I can't sleep afterward. It's always been that way. You've got to, she said. Here are the names of the little boys who've been reported missing in the last three years. Russell DeVerge, Nicholas Tyler. What are you getting at? Nicky, she said. Rusty, David, Roddy, Peter. Are these names ringing a bell with you? I usually don't remember names very well. No, I said. Steve, Howard, Van. The only one that doesn't fit is the last one, Alexander Booth. He disappeared this summer. For some reason, the way Christine was telling me this was making me very upset. She was so agitated about it, and she wouldn't get to the point. So what? I demanded. Scotty's imaginary friends, she said. Come on, I said. But she went over them with me. She had written down all the names of his imaginary friends in our journal back when the therapist asked us to keep a record of his behavior. The names matched up, or seemed to. Scotty must have read an earlier article, I said. It must have made an impression on him. He's always been an empathetic kid. Maybe he started identifying with them because he felt, I don't know, like maybe he'd been abducted from South Bend and carried off to Greensboro. It sounded really plausible for a moment there, the same moment of plausibility that psychologists live on. Christine wasn't impressed. This article says that it's the first time anybody's put all the names together in one place. Hype, I said. Yellow journalism. Scott, he got all the names right. Except one. Oh, I'm so relieved. But I wasn't, because right then I remembered how I'd heard him talking during the pirate video game. Come on, Sandy. I told Christine. Alexander, Sandy, it was as good a fit as Russell and Rusty. He hadn't matched a mere eight out of nine. He'd matched them all. You can't put a name to all the fears a parent feels, but I can tell you that I've never felt any terror for myself that compares to the feeling you have when you watch your two-year-old run toward the street or see your baby go into a seizure or realize that somehow there's a connection between kidnappings and your child. I've never been on a plane seized by terrorists or had a gun pointed to my head or fallen off a cliff, so maybe there are worse fears. But then I have been in a spin on a snowy freeway, and I've clung to the handles of my airplane seat while the plane bounced up and down in midair, and still those weren't like what I felt then reading the whole article. Kids who just disappeared. Nobody saw anybody pick up the kids. Nobody saw anybody lurking around their houses. The kids just didn't come home from school or played outside and never came in when they were called. Gone. And Scotty knew all their names. Scotty had played with them in his imagination. How did he know who they were? Why did he fixate on these lost boys? We watched him that last week before Christmas. We saw how distant he was, how he shied away, never let us touch him, never stayed with the conversation. He was aware of Christmas, but he never asked for anything, didn't seem excited, didn't want to go shopping. He didn't even seem to sleep. I'd come in when I was heading for bed at one or two in the morning, long after he'd climbed up onto his bunk, and he'd be lying there, all his covers off, his eyes wide open. His insomnia was even worse than Jeffrey's, and during the day all Scotty wanted to do was play with the computer or hang around outside in the cold. Christine and I didn't know what to do. Had we already lost him somehow? We tried to involve him with the family. He wouldn't go Christmas shopping with us. We'd tell him to stay inside while we were gone, and then we'd find him outside anyway. I even unplugged the computer and hid all the discs and cartridges, but it was only Jeffrey and Emily who suffered. I still came into the room and found Scotty playing his impossible game. He didn't ask for anything until Christmas Eve. Christine came into my office, where I was writing the scene where Ender finds his way out of the giant's drink problem. Maybe I was so fascinated with computer games for children in that book because of what Scotty was going through. Maybe I was just trying to pretend that computer games made sense. Anyway, I still know the very sentence that was interrupted when she spoke to me from the door. So very calm. So very frightened. Scotty wants us to invite some of his friends in for Christmas Eve, she said. Do we have to set extra places for imaginary friends? I asked. They aren't imaginary, she said. They're in the backyard, waiting. You're kidding, I said. It's cold out there. What kind of parents would let their kids go outside on Christmas Eve? She didn't say anything. I got up and we went to the back door together. 
I opened the door. There were nine of them, ranging in age it looked like from six to maybe ten. All boys, some in shirt sleeves, some in coats, one in a swimsuit. I've got no memory for faces, but Christine does. They're the ones, she said softly, calmly, behind me. That one's Van. I remembered him. Van, I said. He looked up at me. He took a timid step toward me. I heard Scotty's voice behind me. Can they come in, Dad? I told them you'd let them have Christmas Eve with us. That's what they missed the most. I turned to him. Scotty, these boys are all reported missing. Where have they been? Under the house, he said. I thought of the crawl space. I thought of how many times Scotty had come in covered with dirt last summer. How did they get there? I asked. The old guy put him there, he said. They said I shouldn't tell anybody the old guy would get mad, and they never wanted him to be mad at them again. Only I said it was okay, I could tell you. That's right, I said. The landlord's father, whispered Christine. I nodded. Only how could he keep them under there all this time, she said. When does he feed them? When... She already knew that the old guy didn't feed them. I don't want you to think Christine didn't guess that immediately, but it's the, it's the sort of thing you deny as long as you can, and even longer. They can come in, I told Scotty. I looked at Christine. She nodded. I knew she would. You don't turn away lost children on Christmas Eve, not even when they're dead. Scotty smiled. What that meant to us, Scotty smiling... It had been so long. I, I don't think I really saw a smile like that since we moved to Greensboro. Then he called out to the boys. It's okay, you can come in. Christine held the door open, and I backed out of the way. They filed in, some of them smiling, some of them too shy to smile. Go on into the living room, I said. Scotty led the way, ushering them in for all the world like a proud host in a magnificent new mansion. They sat around on the floor... There weren't many presents, just the ones from the kids. We don't put out the presents from the parents till the kids are asleep. But the tree was there, lighted, with all our homemade decorations on it. Even the old needlepoint decorations that Christine made while lying in bed with desperate morning sickness when she was pregnant with Scotty. Even the little puffball animals we glued together for that first Christmas tree in Scotty's life. Decorations older than he was, and not just the tree. The whole room was decorated with red and green tassels and little wooden villages and a stuffed Santa hippo beside a wicker sleigh and a large chimney sweep nutcracker and anything else we hadn't been able to resist buying or making over the years. We called in Jeffrey and Emily and Christine brought in Charlie Ben and held him on her lap while I told the stories of the birth of Christ, the shepherds and the wise men, and the one from the Book of Mormon about a day and a night and a day without darkness. And then I went on and told what Jesus lived for, about forgiveness for all the bad things we do. Everything? asked one of the boys. It was Scotty who answered. No, he said, not killing. Christine started to cry. That's right, I said. In our church we believe that God doesn't forgive people who kill on purpose. And in the New Testament Jesus said that if anybody ever hurt a child, it would be better for him to tie a huge rock around his neck and jump into the sea and drown. Well, it did hurt, Daddy, said Scotty. They never told me about that. It was a secret, said one of the boys. Nikki, Christine says, because she remembers names and faces. You should have told me, said Scotty. I wouldn't have let him touch me. That was when we knew, really knew, that it was too late to save him, that Scotty, too, was already dead. I'm sorry, Mommy, said Scotty. You told me not to play with them anymore, but they were my friends, and I wanted to be with them. He looked down at his lap. I can't even cry anymore. I used it all up. It was more than he'd said to us since we moved to Greensboro in March. Amid all the turmoil of emotions I was feeling, there was this bitterness. All this year, all our worries, all our efforts to reach him, and yet nothing brought him to speak to us except death. But I realize now, it wasn't death. It was, it was the fact that when he knocked we opened the door, that when he asked, we let him and his friends come into our house that night. He had trusted us, despite all the distance between us during that year, and we didn't disappoint him. It was trust that brought us one last Christmas Eve with our boy. But we didn't try to make sense of things that night. They were children and needed what children long for on a night like that. Christine and I told them Christmas stories, and we told about Christmas traditions we'd heard of in other countries and other times. And gradually they warmed up until every one of the boys told all about his own family's Christmases. 
They were good memories. They laughed, they jabbered, they joked. Even though it was the most terrible of Christmases, it was also the best Christmas of our lives, the one in which every scrap of memory is still precious to us, the perfect Christmas in which being together was the only gift that mattered. Even though Christine and I don't talk about it directly now, we both remember it, and Jeffrey and Emily remember it too. They call it the Christmas when Scotty brought his friends. I don't think they ever really understood, and I'll be content if they never do. Finally, though, Jeffrey and Emily were both asleep. I carried each of them to bed as Christine talked to the boys, asking them to help us, to wait in our living room until the police came, so they could help us stop the old guy who stole them away from their families and their futures. They did, long enough for the investigating officers to get there and see them, long enough for them to hear the story Scotty told. Long enough for them to notify the parents. They came at once, frightened because the police had dared not tell them more over the phone than this, that they were needed in a matter concerning their lost boy. They came. With eager, frightened eyes, they stood on our doorstep while a policeman tried to help them understand. Investigators were bringing ruined bodies out from under our house. There was no hope. And yet if they came inside, they would see that cruel providence was also kind. And this time there would be what so many other parents had longed for but never had, a chance to say goodbye. I will tell you nothing of the scenes of joy and heartbreak inside our home that night. Those belong to other families, not to us. Once their families came, once the words were spoken and the tears were shed, once the muddy bodies were laid on canvas on our lawn and properly identified from the scraps of clothing, then they brought the old man in handcuffs. He had our landlord and a sleepy lawyer with him, but when he saw the bodies on the lawn, he brokenly confessed, and they recorded his confession. None of the parents actually had to look at him. None of the boys had to face him again. But they knew. They knew that it was over, that no more families would be torn apart as theirs, as ours had been. And so the boys, one by one, disappeared. They were there, and then they weren't there. With that, the other parents left us, quiet with grief and awe that such a thing was possible, that out of horror had come one last night of mercy and of justice, both at once. Scotty was the last to go. We sat alone with him in our living room, though by the lights and talking we were aware of the police still doing their work outside. Christine and I remember clearly all that was said, but what mattered most to us was at the very end. I'm sorry I was so mad all the time last summer, Scotty said. I knew it wasn't really your fault about moving, and it was bad for me to be so angry, but I just, I just was. For him to ask our forgiveness was more than we could bear. We were full of far deeper and more terrible regrets, we thought, as we poured out remorse for all that we did or failed to do that might have saved his life. When we were spent and silent at last, he put it all in proportion for us. That's okay. I'm just glad you're not mad at me. And then he was gone. We moved out that morning before daylight. Good friends took us in, and Jeffrey and Emily got to open the presents they had been looking forward to for so long. Christine's and my parents all flew out from Utah, and the people in our church joined us for the funeral. We gave no interviews to the press, neither did any of the other families. The police told only of the finding of the bodies and the confession. We didn't agree to it. It's as if everybody who knew the whole story also knew that it would be wrong to have it in headlines in the supermarkets. Things quieted down very quickly. Life went on. Most people don't even know we had a child before Jeffrey. It wasn't a secret. It was just too hard to tell. Yet after all these years, I, th I thought it should be told, if it could be done with dignity, and to people who might understand. Others should know how it's possible to find light shining even in the darkest place. How even as we learned of the most terrible grief of our lives, Christine and I were able to rejoice in our last night with our firstborn son, and how together we gave a good Christmas to those lost boys, and they gave as much to us. That's the end of the story, but I'd like to say a few words more. In August 1988, I brought this story to the Sycamore Hill Writers' Workshop. That draft of the story included a disclaimer at the end, a statement that the story was fiction, that Jeffrey is my oldest child, and that no landlord of mine has ever done us harm. 
The reaction of the other writers at the workshop ranged from annoyance to fury. One writer put it most succinctly when she said, as best I remember her words, by telling this story in first person with so much detail from your own life, you've appropriated something that doesn't belong to you. You've pretended to feel the grief of a parent who has lost a child, and you don't have a right to feel that grief. When she said that, I, I agreed with her. While this story had been rattling around in my imagination for years, I had only put it so firmly in first person the autumn before, at a Halloween party with the students of Watauga College at Appalachian State. Everybody was trading ghost stories that night, and so on a whim I tried out this one. On a whim I made it highly personal, partly because by telling true details from my own life I spared myself the effort of inventing a character, and partly because ghost stories are most powerful when the audience half believes they might be true. It worked better than any tale I'd ever told out loud, and so when it came time to write it down I wrote it the same way. Now, though, this writer's words made me see it in a different moral light, and I resolved to change it forthwith. Yet the moment I thought of revising the story, of stripping away the details of my own life and replacing them with those of a made-up character, I, I felt a sick dread inside. Some part of my mind was rebelling against what Karen said. No, it was saying, she's wrong. You do have a right to tell this story, to claim this grief. I knew at that moment what the story was really about why it had been so important to me. It wasn't a simple ghost story at all. I hadn't written it just for fun. I should have known I never write anything just for fun. This story wasn't about a fictional eldest child named Scotty. It was about my real-life youngest child, Charlie Ben. Charlie, who in the five and a half years of his life has never been able to speak a word to us. Charlie, who could not smile at us until he was a year old, who could not hug us until he was four, who still spends his days and nights in stillness, staying wherever we put him, able to wriggle but not to run, able to call out but not to speak, able to understand that he cannot do what his brother and sister do, but not to ask us why. In short, a child who is not dead, and yet can barely taste life despite all our love and all our yearning. Yet in all the years of Charlie's life, until that day at Sycamore Hill, I had never shed a single tear for him, never allowed myself to grieve. I had worn a mask of calm and acceptance so convincing that I had believed it myself. But the lies we live will always be confessed in the stories that we tell, and I am no exception. A story that I had fancied was a mere lark, a dalliance in the quaint old ghost story tradition, was really the most personal, painful story of my career. And unconsciously I had confessed as much by making it by far the most autobiographical of all my works. Months later, I sat in a car in the snow at a cemetery in Utah, watching a man I dearly love as he stood, then knelt, then stood again at the grave of his eighteen-year-old daughter. I couldn't help but think of what that writer had said. Truly, I had no right to pretend that I was entitled to the awe and sympathy we give to those who have lost a child. And yet I knew that I couldn't leave this story untold, for that would also be a kind of lie. That was when I decided on this compromise. I would publish the story as I knew it had to be written, but then I would write this essay as an afterword, so that you would know exactly what was true and what was not true in it. Judge it as you will. This is the best that I know how to do.